As I told you this morning, we do have a rather lengthy text, which I'd like to read for you now. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. And the reason why I want to deal with it all in one setting is because it is all one story, all one account. It's all driving towards one point. So rather than having the same point for several weeks, I thought we'd just simply get exposed to the whole thing in one shot. And we can maybe look at one of the topics uh, in a little bit more detail this evening in a more devotional way. But let's read the text. Uh, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. Would you listen carefully to this? This is the Lord's word. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, when the the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, And he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said Truly, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. 
From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And know this one is indeed the Savior of the world. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we saw last time that John's disciples had learned uh, from a Jew that Jesus was baptizing and really making more disciples than John was. Many were coming to him. Our passage this morning shows us that the Pharisees were also aware of this, which is why Jesus left Judea, which is where he had been ministering, to go again into Galilee because his time had not yet come. If he had stayed where he was and kept on doing what he was doing, things would escalate to the point where the Jews would want to take him and crucify him. It wasn't his time. That was going to come later. So it was time to move on. But to get to Galilee, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. And he had to do that for two reasons, at least. First of all, because in order to avoid going through Samaria, you'd have to go several miles around because Samaria is basically between Judea and Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria, secondly, because he wasn't trying to avoid it. He knew that his father had made for him there a divine appointment. Now, when Jesus later sends his disciples out, he's going to tell them, don't go the way of the Samaritans and don't even go to the Gentiles, basically for the same reason, because it wasn't yet time for them to receive the gospel. Jesus said on many occasions that he was sent first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They had to hear the gospel first before the others would have the chance. Let the children be fed first and then we'll give the food to the others. And yet Jesus goes through Samaria and it's here that he would teach them some very important lessons regarding evangelism. Now, some of the things that we're going to look at this morning were not things that the disciples actually saw, but many of the things are. And I think Jesus certainly is encouraging them in evangelism. But the things they didn't see, we get to see because John recorded them, so we will be able to benefit from them. So what I want us to see this this morning are basically two things. I, I want us to look at what we can learn about evangelism through Jesus' example. But the second thing, I want us to remember what it is we are offering to people. And I've really spent most of the service already emphasizing that part. And that is that Jesus offers satisfaction of soul. He offers something nobody else can give, contentment. Because the world can never content. It can't give us what we really need. It can't give us what we really want. And again, Jesus tells us what would it profit us if we actually were able to gain the whole world but we lost our souls. Jesus is the only one who satisfies. And that's what he promises to do in the gospel. And that is what we, as we share the gospel with others, need to let others know. Jesus alone satisfies. Now again, these points are going to be mixed up. It's not going to fall out in, in this um, uh, sort of nice, neat pattern. But as you know from, if you happen to have the handouts, there are nine things I want us to see about evangelism. One of them is what it is we're offering. And that is this living water, this satisfaction through Jesus Christ. So what is it that we can learn from Jesus' example? Well, the first thing that we see is that all evangelism actually is by divine appointment. We read in verses 5 through 7. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now Sychar is, is most likely Shechem. Shechem is where Jacob lived. It's where he bought a parcel of ground. It's where he dug a well. Uh, not only for himself, but for his animals. You know, you can't survive very long in the wilderness without water. Wherever the patriarchs went, they, they dug wells. That's just a common thing to do. And here it was that the Israelites had buried Joseph when they brought him out of Egypt. And we know all of this from basically uh, Joshua 24, verse 32. 
Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt, at Shechem, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money. And they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. So basically, this is where Jesus is now on that particular parcel of ground. And being wearied from his trip, he sat by the well. And he was alone, because we read in verse 8, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. It was around the sixth hour, which, of course, is not the same sixth hour as we're familiar with. Basically, it was 12 o'clock noon, the time when travelers would usually stop from their journeys and rest and be refreshed, and also the time when others would seek refreshment too, such as from sources of water, like a well. And it was at this time the Samaritan woman decided that she was going to do the same. Now let me just point out here what we noted last week. Everything that happens in this world, absolutely everything, you know, as far as the expressions on our face, the thoughts in our minds, how cool it is in here, how hot, what's going to happen to us when we leave, and all these things are basically planned by God. They are ordained by Him. And this meeting is no exception. This meeting was also part of God's plan. But we need to recognize that it wasn't just this specific event that was planned by God. Everything is planned by God, which means that when God gives you opportunities to share the gospel, that too is a divine appointment, sovereignly ordained by God. Which is why, realizing that God plans it and he brings that person into your life because you know the gospel and because he wants you to share that gospel, you need to be looking and you need to be ready for those opportunities. So, basically every opportunity for evangelism is by divine appointment. Secondly, we see that we should use and how we can use the circumstances in which those opportunities arise to communicate the gospel. Notice what Jesus does with this situation. First of all, he asks her for a drink. And that's significant for more than one reason. This would be a, at least to some degree, a very provocative move on his part. It would provoke her. And as a matter of fact, we see that's exactly what it did. In verse 9, she says this, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? Well, John, in parenthesis, adds a little bit of background as to why she responded the way that she did. He says, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, I'd like for us just to you know, look at a little bit of background at this particular juncture and, and try to understand the enmity, the hatred that existed between these two groups of people. Perhaps you know the Samaritans are descended from the ten tribes, the northern tribes of Israel, that originally broke away when Solomon's son Rehoboam basically answered the people when they came out saying, you know what, your father made our life hard, can you make it easier? And he said, you think my father was bad, just wait till I get a hold of you. It was at that point Jeroboam broke away with ten tribes, and really that was God's discipline against Solomon for his idolatry. Now this Jeroboam who broke away from, with, from uh, the son of David, from Rehoboam, was the same Jeroboam who set up the two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, and encouraged Israel to worship those calves so they wouldn't return to the true worship of God in Jerusalem and to Rehoboam. So in other words, they set up idolatrous worship. Now, when the ten tribes were later taken captive by Assyria, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon and the other countries he had conquered, and he settled them in the northern area of Israel because he knew if he could uproot people from their countries and put them in other countries, that it would take the fight out of them that they'd be more likely to settle down and obey him because they no longer had anything to hold on to. They were out of their country. Well, these new people that came in brought their false religions and they intermarried with the Jews that were still living in that northern part of Israel. Because of their idolatry, the Lord sent lions into the country to kill them. And because of those lions, they asked the king to send a priest to come out and teach them the customs of the God of that land which he promptly did, only the people we read did not give up their idolatry. 
Now, this group of people living in the northern kingdom are the same people who came out against the Jews who returned from captivity in Babylon from the southern kingdom. When they came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, they were the ones who tried to stop them. Obviously, that doesn't put them in, in the Jews, uh, let's say, in a favorable light. And then finally, Manasseh, not the king of Judah, but the brother of Jedua, who was the high priest in Jerusalem at that time, when he was removed from the Jewish priesthood because he married the daughter of the governor of Samaria, he asked his father-in-law, Sanballat, who was also the one who led the Samaritans against the Jews to try to keep them from building the temple, he asked his father-in-law, build me a temple. Build me a temple on Mount Gerizim and make me the high priest. Well, Sanballat got permission from Alexander the Great to do that, and they built the temple, and he set up Manasseh as the high priest, and that resulted in several of the Jews coming from the southern kingdom to come to the northern kingdom who intermarried with the Samaritans, and of course, there was set up there a religion and a priesthood that was opposed to the Jewish religion at Jerusalem. Now that temple on Mount Gerizim was actually destroyed by a Jewish king in 130 BC, but another temple was later built in Shechem, which is Sychar, or the city in which this woman actually was living. Now is it any wonder that the Samaritans and the Jews were at odds with one another? But I want you to notice Jesus was willing to minister the gospel to this Samaritan woman. And that leads us to another point. By the way, we're going to get back to this other point of using the water or using the circumstances to bring the gospel. But here's another point. This woman isn't just a woman. This woman is a Samaritan woman. And Jesus was willing to take the time and minister the gospel with her, which reminds us that we, thirdly, should be willing to share the gospel with anyone who needs it, even if they happen to be our enemies. And by the way, who needs it? Everybody needs it. Spurgeon reminded us on Wednesday that there are no trespassers in the kingdom of heaven. All may come. All are welcomed by God, whether they're your enemies or his enemies, right? God is not going to turn anyone away. And you and I should not turn anyone away either, even if they happen to be people we don't personally like. You were his enemies. He didn't turn you away, did he? While you were still his enemies, he sent his son to die for you. Now, the same thing is true for any of you here this morning. If you are not yet reconciled to God and are yet his enemies, you need to realize that he stands ready to receive you in his son. He does not put a no trespassing sign over the kingdom of heaven and say, trespassers beware, trespassers will be prosecuted. But he says, whoever wills may come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come and drink. If you're thirsty, come to Christ. Now fourthly, you do need, when you're evangelizing, to make sure you deal with the real need of your hearer and not allow yourself to get sidetracked into controversy. That never happens, does it? Of course not. Well, of course it does. Now I want you to notice that Jesus did not answer her, his, his question, basic, or her question about why is it that you, being a Jew, asked me for a Samaritan? He didn't get embroiled in the controversy. He didn't get tangled up in the history of their two peoples. Instead, he went directly for her need in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I think this is a point that would be very helpful for, uh, helpful for us to remember, especially when we're ministering to those who disagree with us, whatever they may happen to come from. But you know how it is when you try to minister the gospel to a Jehovah's Witness or to a Mormon, and I don't know how many of us have actually ever spoken to a Muslim regarding these things, but the same thing can happen. You can get sidetracked into a whole variety of arguments over things that really don't matter. Isn't that true? You try to settle on one passage and you try to deal with this passage and all of a sudden, well, you guys say this and then suddenly you're arguing over here. Don't let them sidetrack you into fruitless arguments. Stick to the points that are central to the gospel. Keep the conversation focused on their need of Christ. That they need to turn from their sins and trust the true Jesus 
in order to be saved because you're not going to do them any good if you talk about anything else. Fifthly, make sure you tell others what God offers to them, I mean, what it is that he has, what this gift is, which is eternal life. Now, this is where Jesus returns to the theme that he begins when he asked her for a drink of water. He points to the gift of eternal life that God freely offers through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you only knew about this, if you only knew about this gift, you could ask. And God would give her, he would give her that water of life. He would give her the Holy Spirit. It's important in presenting the gospel that you make sure that you tell them what God has to give them. Sometimes, you know, we're, we, we're aware of the fact we need to share the law. We need to convict people of their sins before they see their need of a Savior. But don't forget to tell them that He is a Savior and that He does offer to them eternal life. No, not only that He offers it, but that He will give it if they will only ask Him, if they only want it. That's all they need is simply the desire. Then they can ask and He will give. Again, there's no trespassers here. God's not going to hold anyone back. He won't drive anyone away. All you need to do, if you need Jesus, is ask and receive. All you need to do is sense your need of him, and he will give this gift to you. Now, sixthly, make sure when you're communicating the gospel that you tell them how satisfying eternal life is. It's not just a duration of life. I mean, everybody is going to live forever. Everybody is going to endure forever, right? Everybody's going to be in one of two places. This is a quality of life. Now this is something she still didn't understand. She thought he was still talking about the water that was in the well, literal water. She says in verses 11 and 12, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? No, it's not that water. So Jesus points her in the right direction, verses 13 and 14. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. It's not this water. If you drink from this well, you will become thirsty again, just like when you eat from the world's. You will also become hungry again because it doesn't satisfy. But, he says, if you drink from the water I give you, you will never thirst. But you will have within yourself a well that springs up to eternal life. In other words, a well that never runs dry. Jesus is saying if you come to him to, re -gift, to receive from him the gift of his Holy Spirit, you will be satisfied. You won't need anything else to make you happy. You won't need anything else to make you content. You will no longer need the things of the world. You won't need the world's attention. You won't need the world's praise. You won't need the things of the world. You will have enough. That's why Jesus said on another occasion in the, what we call the kingdom parables in Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see, when you have the kingdom of heaven, these other things become unimportant, and you're willing to give them all up in order to receive them. This was the secret that Paul found, the secret of contentment. He goes, I know how to get along in good circumstances. I know how to get along in, in very meager circumstances. I, I have learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. He had this well of water springing up within his soul that quenched his thirst that was enough, that contented him. When Jesus gives you this water, everything else becomes unimportant. You will let go of the things that you hope to find satisfaction in for the things that you know will satisfy. So make sure when you're sharing the gospel that you tell those that you share it with that they can be in a position where they will never thirst again, where they will be content.
And those of you who are here this morning who may not have found contentment, who still want more of the things that will never satisfy you, need to realize they never will satisfy you. You're never going to get enough. No one ever has of the world. And that's because the world cannot satisfy. Only Jesus can. Seventh, be sure you tell them who has this life, where it is they can get it. Jesus Christ, in verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Jesus now has the woman's attention. But she still doesn't know exactly who it is that's speaking with her, but she needs to know if she is to receive this life that he has to give. And so now he sets out to show her that he is in fact the Christ. You do have to come to the right source to receive this. Not just know the gift is out there. You need to know who has it to give. So he says to her in verses 16 through 18, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now I want you to notice that she that she has had five husbands and she wasn't married to the one that she was now living with. Now she either outlived five husbands, which isn't very likely, or she was divorced from five husbands. And I think it's more likely that the latter is true, that her marriage has ended in divorce due to infidelity because of the fact now that she was living with a man out of wedlock. And also it's interesting when she goes into the city, she doesn't talk necessarily to the women of the city, but she talks to the men. Now I want you to notice one thing here that I just couldn't resist dealing with. That Jesus said that she was married to the four men that followed the first. Okay, I want you to see that. She had been married five times. And what Jesus is telling us here is that one is not necessarily the limit. There is the possibility of marriage after divorce. This is one of the texts that reminds us of that because she was likely divorced from each one, not on biblical grounds, and yet she was married five times. But I want you to notice as well that even though the woman was living in an adulterous relationship now and had, well, undoubtedly committed adultery many times, Jesus did not shun her. Jesus evangelized her. Jesus said, it's not those who are well that need the physician, not all those who are squeaky clean, and there is nobody who is well. There is nobody who is squeaky clean, although there are those who believe they are. It's not the ones who are well, but the ones who are sick who need the physician. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And this reminds us that we must do this as well. Now what Jesus said had the desired effect. He was trying to lead her to the conclusion that he was the Messiah. In verse 19, we see this. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You couldn't possibly know about my past unless God had revealed it to you because we just met. But I want you to notice something else, that she still wants to get sidetracked. She still hasn't been brought to the main point, and Jesus will bring her back. Instead of asking Jesus, the prophet, more about this living water, she decides instead, settle the question, Jesus, that exists between our two people. Who's right? Are we right or are the Jews right? Verse 20, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And here's <clears throat> where we get to our eighth point. And people again try to sidetrack you. Try to get the conversation back on track. Her question was only indirectly related to her spiritual well-being. But Jesus answers her in a way that gets her again going down the right path. First of all, he does settle the matter. The Jews are God's people. Jerusalem is the place where you want to worship. But he also gets to the heart of the matter in verses 21 through 24. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain, and again he's pointing to Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, 
And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now Jesus, first of all, says an hour is coming when where you worship God is not going to matter any longer. And that, of course, would be following the crucifixion when the veil of the temple is torn and the temple worship becomes defunct. But the time has already come when how you worship does matter. You must worship the Father, he says, in spirit and in truth because that is the kind of worshiper that the Father wants. Now, we're going to look at this a little bit more in depth this evening, but to worship in spirit means to worship free from the types and shadows, free from location. And it means to worship in the power of the Spirit. To worship in truth means to do it according to God's truth, which the Samaritans were not doing, but it also means to do it sincerely from the heart. And this is only possible through the Spirit which you can only receive if you come to Jesus, the Messiah, and receive living water. If someone sidetracks your efforts to bring the, the gospel to them, make sure you try to tie what they're saying back into the message and stay on task because it's only the gospel that can save them. All the other things may be interesting and they are important to a certain degree, but they're not as important as the gospel. Now, maybe she didn't quite believe what Jesus had to say about the Jews. After all, this debate had been long-standing. Or maybe she was fishing because she suspected who Jesus was. But she said next in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming. John tells us he who is called the Christ, just so we understand who Messiah is. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us Jesus says in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now this brings us back to point seven. We need to know where to get the living water. We need to know who it is that offers it. To receive the gift of eternal life, to receive the living water that God offers, you must not only know it's available, that it's out there, but you also need to know where to get it. You can only get it through Jesus. Now, Jesus said to the Jews on another occasion, I'm sure this is very familiar, in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, okay, included, but I am, you will die in your sins. In order to be saved, in order to escape death, in order to escape eternal judgment for your sins, you have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but you also have to believe that he is the Messiah that the Bible speaks about. It's not just a name. It's a person who has particular characteristics and qualities. This Messiah, the only Messiah that really exists, is the I Am. We saw this, remember, in John 1.1. 1, 1. God in your nature. No other Christ can save you. So Jesus in doing this, I mean, why did Jesus ask her to go out and get her husband and all this? It's because he wanted to show her who he was. Because if he didn't show her that, she wouldn't then trust in him the way she should in order to receive that living water. All these things are important. We must share the gift, make them aware there's a gift, what that gift is, and who it is they must receive that gift from. Now, ninthly, and this is the last the last main point, I think, you need to be aware that the Lord is preparing a people to receive him and will bring them home. In other words, you're not doing this on your own. You're not going out necessarily to break up the ground and to start preparing it. Sometimes that work is already done. We read in verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? You know, Jesus' disciples had finally returned with the food they were seeking and found Jesus speaking with this woman and they really didn't know what to say because to speak with a woman was, was not a, necessarily something that Jewish men would do. So, you know, it's, it wasn't a common practice uh, in a public place and especially with a Samaritan woman. So they were a little bit taken back by this, but of course what our Lord did, there was nothing inappropriate about it, it's just that the Jewish men would distance themselves from that because of the stigma surrounding it. And while they stood staring at him in amazement, the woman left the water pot behind and went into the city to tell all the men she could find about what had just happened. Verse 29, 
Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? So she believed, and out of her joy and excitement, she goes to tell others what she had found. Of course, when the Lord brings you savingly to himself, this is the effect it initially has. You want to tell the people you know about Jesus Christ so they can receive this gift as well. The downside to it is that when we become Christians and after we've told all of our non-Christian friends about Jesus Christ and they've either accepted him or rejected him and we no longer have no non-Christian friends. Uh, and we don't seem to, to you know, do a lot to cultivate it because we spend a lot of our time with Christian friends. Well, this reminds us that we do need to cultivate relationships with people who, who don't know Jesus Christ because it's only in the context of a relationship that you can effectively share. Even when we go out and evangelize door to door, you still have to make a connection before you're going to be able to communicate. And the best connection is some kind of relationship. Well, notice her efforts were not wasted. We read in verse 30, they went out of the city and they were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were encouraging him to eat. But he says to them in verse 32, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And they were wondering whether or not somebody had brought him food out of the city. But Jesus wasn't talking about the kind of food that you eat and get hungry again. He was talking about the kind of food that feeds the soul that is renewed by, the God, by God's grace, basically. He was talking about doing God's will. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You know, here's another proof that once you drink from the well that satisfies, that nothing else is going to satisfy you, nothing of this world, because once you've drunk of this water, the things of the world no longer satisfy. My food is not food, Jesus says. My food is not what the world has to offer. It's not its glory. It's not, you know, the, the, you know, the various things the world may have. It's riches. It's things. Because those things leave you hungry, hungering for more. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me, to do the thing which God has sent me into the world to do, the reason why he made me. That's how you can know that you've really drunk of this fountain of life is that the things of the world no longer satisfy. The only thing that satisfies you is actually doing what God made you to do. It's fulfilling that purpose for which he made you. It's worshiping him. Not just here on the Lord's Day for an hour or an hour and a half or maybe an hour and 45 minutes, but with your life, with your whole life. But now here's something we don't often think about. Jesus, as he sees the Samaritans coming out of the city, he says to his disciples, and I think sometimes we divorce this statement from the context of what's taking place. The woman has already gone into the city. She's talked to the men. The men are coming out to see him. And Jesus sees them coming out of the city, a, a large group of men. And he says this in verses 35 through 38 to his disciples. Do you not say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. What fields? The fields of grain? No, the fields of the Samaritans. That they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now Jesus was reminding them that the annual harvest where the fields of grain were going to be, you know, that was still four months away, but here was a field that was already ripe for harvest, a field of souls. Now reaping that particular harvest might not put money in the bank, he said, but it will store up treasures in heaven. It will be a blessing to those who receive him because they're going to be delivered from death into life, from hell to heaven. And it's going to be a blessing also to those who originally labored in the field to, to sow it. Now one thing we need to recognize is that neither Jesus nor his disciples had really sown in this field before. It, was, it had been sown though. Not perfectly. I mean, what field is perfectly sown, right? It had been sown long ago when, when God had called Israel apart to himself and Abraham because these Samaritans were actually descendants of the 12 original tribes. It was sown when the priest was sent from the king of Assyria to teach the people the custom of the God of that land. 
It was sown when the rival priesthood was set up, and it may have been wrong, and the Pentateuch that they had, which is called the Samaritan Pentateuch, may have been corrupt in a, in a variety of areas, but they still had something of God's words. So Jesus is saying, you know, as he is, you know, he sowed a little bit there with the woman at the well, but what he was reaping was actually benefiting from years of sowing that had come from some other source. Now Jesus was telling his disciples, I'm doing the same thing for you. I want you to recognize that. I'm sending you to reap in another field that you have not labored in, and that is among Israel, among Judah, among the Jews, not the Samaritans, because it wasn't yet time for the Samaritans. And you need to recognize that ground has been sown. It's already been broken up. It's been sown by Moses. It's been sown by the prophets. John the Baptist had been preaching for six months, and he was still at it. He hadn't been taken captive yet. He hadn't been taken into custody. Those two are ripe. There are some that have been brought to the point of harvest. Now this reminds us that there is always something to do in God's field. There's either sowing to be done, you know, by witnessing and praying, or there's reaping to be done, bringing people home to Christ because that seed has already been sown, it's already been watered. God promises that when you're involved in this work that he's going to reward you whether you're sowing or whether you are reaping. But we need to be sowing and we need to be either sowing or reaping or watering or doing something in the process at all times. Now John ends this account with the reaping that took place among the Samaritans in verses 39 through 42. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and know this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, I do want you to notice that the woman testified. She just told them about Jesus. And for some, that's all that was necessary, but for others, they came out to Jesus, and Jesus did the rest. Now, ultimately, Jesus is going to do virtually all the work except for one thing, which is something he needs for us to do. We need to tell other people because, yes, you know, there are Gideons, there are people that are putting Bibles everywhere, there are people that are sending Bibles directly to homes. We used to do that. It was something the church we were a part of did. And there were people in other countries who received a Bible in their own language. Well, they, they just learned something about Jesus. But somebody had to do that too, didn't they? Somebody has to communicate the word. And God has given that task to us. So there has to be somebody who's going to be communicating this gospel. But that's all we really need to do besides praying, is communicate the gospel and then seek the Lord of the harvest to bring that soul home. We tell them the gospel, and that's all we can do. God doesn't hold us responsible for saving their souls. Maybe you know somebody that you witnessed to your entire life and prayed for them, and they still didn't come to Christ. That's a very sad thing. But it's not because of you. It's, it's ultimately because of, of God's choosing, but again, it's also because that particular individual was never hungered and never thirsted after Christ. After that living water, they need to, otherwise they will not come. God holds us responsible to share that gospel. We need to make it as beautiful and as desirable as we possibly can. We need to adorn it with a life that is consistent with the message that we are actually telling them, that we're actually preaching to them and bearing witness to. But ultimately, Jesus is the one who has to bring them home. He just simply wants you to tell them about him. If you do that... Jesus is going to take care of everything else. So don't feel like you have to convert them because you can't convert them. Only Jesus can. You just need to tell them the good news. So the Lord is in the process of preparing ground, sowing ground, breaking up ground, watering ground, and he is in the process of reaping. This is his work, and it's ongoing, but he does it through us. We have to be involved in this. So let me just say, by way of application to believers, those of you who trust Jesus Christ this morning, 
If you are a believer, learn from Jesus' example. Know that the Lord has divine appointments that he wants you to keep. Have a heart that is willing and ready to share the gospel at all times. Make sure you stick to the gospel. Don't let people sidetrack you into fruitless discussion, fruitless debates. Be willing to share the gospel with anyone who needs Jesus. Anyone the Lord sends your way, even if they happen to be your enemies. And let's not forget that this process isn't just about reaping. I think sometimes we think, if we haven't reaped, we've failed. It's also about sowing. It's also about watering. And whether you sow or water or reap, don't forget God is going to bless you either way, and he's going to reward you either way. So be encouraged by this example to sow. Take your bag of seed, the gospel, and sow as broadly as you possibly can. Secondly, if you're not a believer here this morning, I want to just again remind you of this. Know that the world is never going to satisfy you. You realize the woman who spoke with Jesus thought that she was going to find satisfaction in the area that most people look for it today, and that's in relationships. Again, I, you, I'm sure you know this, but the people that people most admire, the celebrities and so forth, have you ever looked at their biographies? Have you ever looked at their lives? I mean, like, not just to, just to choose one person out of, the, out of the blue. Mickey Rooney, who just recently passed away, do you know that he was married like five, six, seven times? I mean, it, just a huge number of times. He was looking for happiness in relationships, and he didn't find it in relationships. Neither did this woman. She had had five husbands and was living with a man out of wedlock and she still had not found what she was looking for because you can't find satisfaction in those areas. Things that are limited, things that are finite can never satisfy. Only something that is infinite can. Only Jesus can. So learn a lesson from this. Don't waste your time with the world because you're never going to find happiness there. Listen to what Jesus says this morning. If you know who he is, if you know the gift that he has, ask of him, and he will give you that which alone will satisfy your soul, which is a personal relationship with him and his Father through the Holy Spirit. All you need to do is ask. If you're thirsty, come to Jesus, and he will give you that water which satisfies. Let's bow for a moment of, of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard, and we have heard a lot, but particularly these closing points, that he would help us to apply them as we really need to apply them this morning.